SJC 11841, George Goh, the Commissioner of the Probation Service of the, of the Massachusetts Trial Court. One second, Ms. Eisenberg. Good morning, mm -hmm. Chief Justice wait, Gantz. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, I restrain I... your enthusiasm. Oh. <clears throat> now release your enthusiasm. Good morning, <laughs> Chief Justice Gantz and Honorable Justices Beth Eisenberg and Lily Lockhart uh, for the probationer. Um, I, I am concerned that the, the flurry of briefs have obscured somewhat the issues that are presented in this case. And as this is my only opportunity to address this court, I'm, I would ask you to please grant me the first two or three minutes of argument to lay out the claims so that discussion thereafter is fruitful for the court. <laughs> there are constitutional, God bless you, issues and in interstate compact issues. The plaintiff <coughs> says here that he's entitled to two <coughs> evidentiary hearings or, or, or one evidentiary hearing on two constitutional issues, and that is whether mandatory GPS monitoring of this minor convicted as an adult is so penologically excessive as to constitute cruel or unusual punishment. And the second is whether a categorical bar set by commissioner of probation on this 16-year-old from ever stepping foot outside the state of Massachusetts for 10 years without an individualized determination violates due process of law. Now, the plaintiff has suggested that the travel ban is ultra virus, but even if this court did not so find, I want to stress to, to, to the court that we have not asked you to make ultimate findings on the question of whether these conditions are, in fact, unconstitutional as applied to him. What we're saying is, is that we have established claims that are sufficiently compelling and sufficiently powerful to entitle him to a hearing where he can produce evidence and testimony that supports these claims and from which a neutral and detached judge can make findings of fact, <clears throat> conclusions of law, and may be reviewed if necessary. Now, there are also two preliminary issues that this court must consider under the interstate compact in order to determine whether this plaintiff gets the hearings that he's requested. And this involves <coughs> Compact Rule 4.101 and 4.103, which we've included in our uh, addendum and which I believe the commissioner has as well. Now, under Compact Rule 4101, it is our position that this court must first determine whether, as a child convicted as a sex offender elsewhere, this plaintiff is a similar offender, quote unquote, as that term is used under the rule, uh, to adults who are sentenced here in Massachusetts as sex offenders, and that is clearly a question of state law. Because if he is a similar offender, then the interstate compact requires him to be supervised in a manner consistent with adults in Massachusetts. And this court has not yet said whether persons subject to mandatory GPS monitoring, be they children or adults, may challenge that punishment <coughs> on cruel or unusual grounds. If the plaintiff is a similar offender to adults here, may he nevertheless bring a claim before a Massachusetts court that treating him as if he were an adult violates the cruel or unusual punishment provisions under Article 26. Are, are, are we bound by the Connecticut determination that he effectively is an adult? No, uh, not at all. I, and In fact, we, we have a, a, a quote from a Supreme a uh, United States Supreme Court case in our brief that basically says one state is not bound to uh, adopt the substantive law of another state, particularly under this scheme. But, but, but it's not a substantive determination. They, they, haven't they treated him, as a matter of fact, haven't they treated him as an adult? They, ha they have treated him as an adult under that law. But and I'm sorry. No, it's finishing. I, it's, I shouldn't interrupt you. Go ahead. No, they have treated him as an adult under that law, but there is still this open question of whether he should be subject to mandatory GPS monitoring, whether that determination of him as an adult, in, in other words, being convicted, whether the fact that he was convicted there and is monitored here as a convicted adult requires this state to substantively apply uh, the same considerations that Connecticut would to him 
as an adult in Connecticut, because in fact he is a juvenile. We've seen in cases here in Massachusetts, Diachenko is a, is a, a good example of a case where children, though convicted uh, as adults, are viewed differently under our own constitutional so, scheme. So on that point, if I look at rules 4.101 and 4.103, and yes. I'm thinking about 103A in particular, yes. is it not possible to say, I mean, I thought part of your argument, but maybe it isn't, is that at, under 103A, that at the time of the acceptance of the term of probation when your client was still a juvenile, um, Right. Wasn't he? Yeah, at the time of acceptance of probation here. Yes. Yes. And he, he certainly he was. was a juvenile he when he committed 16. the when he committed the crime. Yes. Um, that that under this particular provision, it, it seems to me when there's an argument that at the at that time the the supervising authority in the receiving state, it says, may impose a special condition. Uh, if that special condition would have been imposed on the offender if the sentence had been imposed in the receiving state. And I thought your point was you couldn't get this sentence well, in the receiving that state. Is right. that and is therefore you couldn't, since he was a juvenile, you couldn't have imposed a mandatory, you could do it discretionarily, but you could not do it mandatorily. That is right. That is correct. That, that doesn't even get to the Constitution. That's just... Correct. That's right. That's a statutory interpretation, and that is argument two of our brief. And essentially... It is one way of, this case is almost like a kaleidoscope and you just keep clicking the lenses to see the issues in different ways. And in that particular view of the issues, what we say is if you take the, the, the plain language of the interstate compact, which is binding on this state, the plain language suggests that this individual would have to be sentenced in Massachusetts in order for him to be subject to the same conditions. Well, to be able to be sentenced. Obviously, he doesn't have to be sentenced here. Right, to be able to be sentenced, yes. In, in, in terms of this kaleidoscope that you're describing, if you're right, uh, how does this work in the future? Does, yeah. it, does, does, it, does it come up at a violation of probation hearing? Is, a, is there a, yeah. an action for declaratory relief before, you know, as soon as he enters Massachusetts? How does it work? Yes, yes. Well, here it worked because there was no, <clears throat> there was no docket number, trial court docket number associated with the case. But he was, in fact, when he first came, he was being supervised by the juvenile court until he reached his majority, and then he was transferred. So even the commissioner... So, 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 how, does, so how does it play out so in the future? I think what, I would what we would suggest is that in its superintendent authority, this court could establish a protocol for such interstate probationers to have a docket number associated, a trial court docket number associated. But when does the issue come up? But does it come up when he enters Massachusetts? Does it come up on a, a, a violation of probation hearing? Before you get there, though, don't you have to worry about the interstate compact saying that the jurisdiction over this sentence and everything connected to it is in the sentencing state? The jurisdiction over this sentence is in the sentencing state, but the interstate compact provides explicitly for conditions, additional conditions. It to be does, but it, but it seems to me it's not a foregone conclusion by any stretch that the fact that the interstate commerce provides for this state as the receiving state to do certain things means that this is the state that gets to hear the challenge about whether that's okay or not, as opposed to the sending state. Whether what is okay well, or not. Well, uh, for example, that whether the whether the the uh, probation condition that was, I mean, this is really the first question, I guess, that's reported, right. uh, whether the probation condition that was imposed um, is uh, beyond, is permissible, uh, is beyond the sentencing, the scope of the sentence in Connecticut in this case. I mean, in other words, to question uh, the validity of that Massachusetts um, additional um, condition. I think if the receiving state is the state that is empowered to set the conditions, uh, I, 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 th I think it defies notions of 
But but you did your client did go back to Connecticut to try he, to get these things changed. He there. did because he uh, it, as uh, as we understood it he he did so because this policy of the commissioner is to require people to go back to to uh, at least well, under that's, the that's travel for, policy. That, that's for the travel. But no, I, but he he did go back. But but really, when you think about it, what he asked the Connecticut court to do was not to change ma the Massachusetts rule, but to say to the Connecticut court, will you relieve me or modify my, my conditions that you have set? And they did so. And at that point, I mean, they deferred. Well, they didn't do that. What if they said, what if they said you, uh, that, that, that you do not have to wear a GPS for uh, probation and you, there will be no uh, restriction on your interstate travel? If, if they had done that, Massachusetts would have accepted it, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they have had to? No, no, no not necessarily. Why? Because... Because if he's an adult, because the way Massachusetts views him is, notwithstanding the fact that they don't put GP, mandatory GPS monitoring on him, here in Massachusetts, the commissioner's position is, because he's an adult, he's been convicted as adult, he must be treated similarly to adults, and we have the discretion to impose special conditions. That's what Rule 4103 says. Let, it let, says the receiving state may impose <coughs> a special condition on an offender, and Rule 4.103-1 says, even if the sending state didn't set a condition, if the receiving state's condition is violated, the sending state has the authority to pull the probationer back into the state for, for revocation proceedings. So I, I do not think the fact that I, I think the way I understand this scheme is that Connecticut sets conditions that follow the individual. If Massachusetts tells Connecticut we can't enforce this condition and it's n not a mandatory transfer as it was here, Connecticut can either remove the condition or, or deny that probation or the right to transfer. So let me, let me, let's go back to it, something simple because this, this really is quite confusing. Let's assume Connecticut had set GPS as a condition of probation. Mm -hmm. Juvenile convicted as an adult under Connecticut law, the court had said GPS for the 10 years of your probation. He had then been trans he then transferred his probation to Massachusetts. Problem? M Massachusetts would have had to enforce that. Right. Okay, so that's not a problem. Well, so and it's, here it's not mandatory. It, it's not mandatory insofar as he may be able to go back to Connecticut and say, I, I, "I want to be heard on this again." The problem arises in this particular case where Connecticut has no such mandate. Massachusetts has a mandate, and the question is, should that mandate be applicable to? A, a, a juvenile who is treated as an adult oh, in another state. So remind me, the original sentence in Connecticut included GPS, we'll call it electronic monitoring, in the discretion of the probation department. That's right? correct. <laughs> and did that get changed at some point? Yes, it did. And got changed to what? It got changed uh, in April of 2014 um, by the sentencing court to... Um, in the discretion of the juvenile exactly. probation officer here. Exactly, it was, it was here. deferred to met the question of GPS monitoring at all was deferred to the authority of Massachusetts. So if you get if deferred to the authority, yes, to the, to, to the probation where, department. Where do you see that in the record? It's a one Wait, where? Where in the record is that? Could you read us exactly the language? Yes, yes, I will. Because there seems to be a dispute. No. Yes, right. there is. There are two. There are two. Yes, There's there is. GPS monitoring would be at the discretion of mass probation, but then March 3rd of 15, it says do GPS there. Right. That's after the no, hearing. Um, but that that was, if you look at the transcript, the transcript basically shows that there was no order of GPS monitoring. We dispute that vigorously because the only time GPS monitoring came up in, in Connecticut was at the very end of the hearing after the revocation had been heard and after the, the disposition had been entered, 
the defense attorney said to the sentencing court, he's not wearing a bracelet. Massachusetts requires him to wear a bracelet. He's here without a bracelet. Help me understand the mechanism of getting him back into Massachusetts and back on the bracelet that Massachusetts requires. And there was some discussion about that on the record. And at the end, you know, the, the, the judge <coughs> and, the, and the prosecutor said, speak with probation about it and they'll figure it out. Good, and it was, it was translated in a notation as do GPS there. Now, it, he's now an adult. He is now an adult. Does it make a difference? It does. I mean, it, you know, it, so well, it we, doesn't make moved? a difference. It doesn't make a difference insofar as the, you know, the, 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 the sentence follows the individual. The individual doesn't follow the sentence. So what happened but if happened he when he was in his minority. But if he had been convicted right now in Massachusetts mm -hmm. at age 18, mm -hmm. mandatory GPS would be part of it, right? That's, that's, that's correct. Unless, you know, there, there is a colorable claim, as there is here, that uh, as to him, it is cruel or unusual punishment. Under our Constitution or the federal Constitution? Well, our claim was made specifically under Article 26. Okay, if I can, I, if I can step, I know you're over, your, over your time, but this is an unusually, not, perhaps not unusually, but a complex. It Let is me just complex. make sure that I understand what you are saying, or at least what I hear you saying. Okay. I hear you saying, first of all, that you say essentially that we should expand Hansen to include children who are convicted as adults. Yes, yes. I, it, it's our, it's, it, what we're saying is that it should, it should be understood that it can be considered by a court that hears the evidence. In other words, we've made a robust record, but there's been no determination okay. of evidence. There's so, never been a so, hearing. So, on so this. if you prevail on that, yes. Okay, if we yes. were to say yes. he was a juvenile as far as we're concerned in Connecticut and pro probation should treat him as if he were a juvenile and now it rests in the discretion of probation yes. as to whether to do a GPS. Yes. And if probation were to say we've exercised our or our discretion yes. and we still think he should have GPS, are you done or then you'd have to argue Then we have a good win hearing essentially, right? Then we have a hearing in which you know they they have to make some showing that this material change why a his, change the, the change is that there's been no, that pro, GPS has been deferred and that now GPS is in, imposed in his own discretion. I mean, the, 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 the Connecticut court has said, we don't care about GPS anymore. Let Massachusetts figure out whether they want to put him on GPS or not. GPS, whether it's mandatory or discretionary, is significantly punitive. And so it seems that if the com commissioner wants to put GPS monitoring well, on him. You, you don't read his letter to you as sort of being an, indi an individualized determination that he thought your client should be on a GPS? The, there was his, his initial letter was based on information that had not been tested by an independent court. And so in our view, it was unilateral. And in our view, that it, it was um, a determination that was made without the benefit of being able to um, test that evidence, um, uh, contest that evidence, and, and <coughs> be able to show a, a magistrate or, an, or a judge why, in fact, that should not be the case. But if your client were still in Connecticut, it would be probation's determination it as would to be. whether. It Shouldn't would it be, be the same here? Why? Well, I mean, under we Massachusetts were... law, it isn't the probation department's <coughs> determination. If it's here. our, isn't if it it's our probationer, but when we're receiving it pursuant to the Connecticut standard, which says we give probation that discretion, right. and the court there says that's up to probation, right. are we not bound by what Connecticut has done to let probation render that determination? It's, it's up to the receiving state. The, the court did say, it, I, we defer to probation, but our position is that in Massachusetts, these kinds of conditions that carry excessive penalties and are, are stringent to a degree that's unusual, 
it, it should not be in the uh, unilateral authority of the probation commissioner, but there should be an opportunity to be able to test that somehow if the probationer believes that as to him, it poses an unconstitutional penological burden on him. That's our position. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. May it please the court. My name is Stephen Strom, and I, I represent the intervener, the Interstate Commission for Adult Offender Supervision. With the permission of the court, I'd like to take five minutes of the respondent's time and leave the balance of the time to Attorney Joss for the Commissioner of Probation. The Interstate Commission has intervened in this case because of the serious public harm that would be caused to both public safety and the rules of the interstate compact. Public safety? Yes, Your Honor, because there are 235,000 individuals on parole and probation across the country in and out of different states. And if this court were to allow a challenge to the sentence and conviction and conditions of the sending state in the receiving state, then the uniformity that is the compact amongst that's the states. That's not what Ms. Eisenberg's arguing for. Well, that's precisely she's arguing that in, she can get an evidentiary hearing, essentially um, <clears throat> modifying the conditions of, of the sentence of the sending state. It would, well, help me with that. You, you say it would, the world would, the world as we know it would collapse if we were to do what? To, oh, to disregard the rules of the compact, specifically Rule 4.101, which is federal law binding not only on the but it, it would allow offenders who do not like the conditions in the receiving state, whatever additional or special conditions. And there has been no additional condition imposed here. On March 13, 2015, when uh, Justice Cordy issued his reservation and report, on that same day, this particular petitioner was in a Connecticut court on a violation of probation. Do we have the complete transcript? It appears, yes, Your Honor, it appears in the... Do that the way we read it. It appears in um, the respondent's addendum at eight, page 80 through 89, and specifically at um, page A87, the court in the sentencing court, the sending jurisdiction here, said, you know, you have to understand that you're on intensive sex offender probation. So this petitioner had a violation of probation. He did not have a travel ban. He went back to the sending state and adjudicated the disposition of probation. The he, did, he adjudicated and stood in front of a, a Connecticut judge and was um, facing five years of incarceration. So he induced the Connecticut judge to continue probation. Induced? And allow, yes. By How about a, persuaded? Persuaded. Uh, how about deceived? Oh, oh, because, Your Honor, Your Honor, there was no challenge to GPS in open court. The, there was no notification to the Connecticut judge that this petition was pending at the time. The Connecticut court ordered intensive soup, sex offender probation. There was questions about the GPS. The only question was, how do we get it put back on? There was no claim that this is an illegal sentence. picked up for another violation. That's what that was about. Your Honor, there are numerous places where this petitioner can get an evidentiary hearing, none of which are in the jurisdiction here. He can move to modify the condition of probation. He could claim it's, file a motion that it's an illegal sentence. He can file numerous post-conviction remedies in the sending state. He so are you saying that we're supposed to listen to some uh, construction of the interstate compact that is by the federal courts? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The, the, and, the and, rules. And which, which case do you say um, is controlling here? Well, the, the Kyler versus Adams uh, is a United States Supreme Court case that says that the interstate compact is federal law. Well, that's fine, but what's the case that says that? that well, the two of the cases that were cited in the re reservation and report, for example, um, on page four of the reservation and report, State v. Warner, the Iowa case, under that, under that case, it says the receiving state has the right to supervise the that, petitioner. That's a state case, right? It is. It's from. We're um, supposed to listen to an Iowa case. These are all under under um, 
federal law because you interpret the interstate <coughs> compact under federal can, can law. I, but, can, so go, go. Uh, the Goings case is the only case that was adjudicated in the receiving state. And in that case, it was an injunction or declaratory action in the receiving state. And the only condition that was removed, in that case, Florida had no sex offender registration. Florida had no um, GPS. And those conditions were continued in the receiving state. The only condition that was removed was a condition. Now, the interstate uh, can, I, can I ask, you, before you go any further, let me, l let me try to understand a, a couple of basic things here. Um, conditions of probation imposed in Connecticut, they have to be enforced in the receiving state unless the receiving state says no can do, has to go back to Connecticut, right? Correct, Your Honor. That's interstate commerce, uh, right. interstate compact. Yes, Your Honor. Got, receiving state, in addition, can impose additional conditions. Yes, Your Honor. They're, they're imposed by the receiving state, not the sending state. Correct. So doesn't the individual have an opportunity to challenge those additional conditions in the receiving state that are imposed by the receiving state? Uh, I'm, not aware, I'm not aware of anything in the compact that would prohibit this petitioner from bringing, for example, a 1983 action in the district court in Massachusetts. However, the, the, the Supreme Court case of Heck versus Humphrey, this appears to be a wholesale attack on the Connecticut conviction, claiming that the conviction as an adult with a combination of GPS is cruel and unusual punishment. Well, if, 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 uh, if the Connecticut court had said no GPS and no ban on interstate travel, he comes to Massachusetts, could Massachusetts impose uh, GPS on him? Under the compact, yes, Your Honor. And so he, if he were to challenge that, let's, let's put aside the larger challenge, just if he were to challenge that, um, could he do it here? Under the, and still be and still do so consistent with the interstate compact. Well, he, he is doing it here. Well, I, as, isn't but I'm, I but know, but isn't that court, okay? If this court were say today to issue an injunction right from the bench and say remove the GPS, then that would be communicated through the ICOT system, the interstate compact offender tracking system, back to Connecticut. Connecticut could decide. Should we, we leave this yeah. probationer in Massachusetts, or can we retake, or should we retake him? Sounds fair. That, that's how it would work. Same thing on the initial, on the initial um, application in, in 2013. If, this, if the Connecticut court said mandatory GPS, but your section 47 was the exact opposite and said no probationer in Connecticut can be supervised, Massachusetts would report back, as Your Honor indicated, we can't supervise them as required by the sending state, so we can't accept the case. They wouldn't have accepted the case at, at the end. Okay. And if Connecticut says we're going to leave the issue of GPS up to probation, and if probation decides not to do it, there's no violation of the compact, is there? Uh, under the compact, no. Strictly under the compact, no. It's up to the determination of the... That's like the... Um, Hanson H case where this court said an individual juvenile judge in an individual case could determine that GPS is appropriate for a juvenile. So that's exactly okay. so so if that's what this case is. So I mean I know you, you began with this statement that we are right now the whole interstate compact now lurks in the balance it, but it, but I, I don't if if the if the Connecticut court says I'm going to leave it up to Massachusetts probation to decide whether to impose GPS. Then how is, how, how is Connecticut being dishonored if they exercise that discretion? Because right now, Connecticut has said, after the violation of probation, intensive sex offender probation. And that depends on your interpretation of that transcript. Right. But and, the, and how do we, let's assume that we can't necessarily be sure what then do we do to ascertain what then the Connecticut judge That's exactly really right. There's an operation, not in the courts, but through the interstate compact offices and the compact administrators from Massachusetts to back to Connecticut for um, a request to clarify the sentence. Do you, that's do a very you think simple that the, the, the probation violation hearing in 15 supersedes the ruling in the, the order in 14 that GPS monitoring is left in the discretion of the state of Massachusetts probation program? Yes, it was an increase in supervision in 2015 after the violation. As it didn't GPS. mention GPS, did it? Oh, it, it, it mentioned intensive sex offender probation. I don't know what that means. That, well, that's what, let's assume no one here knows what it means. The remedy is under the compact. Wasn't it what he was already under? No, he was, he was under 
um, the modification of, of April 2014. He which wasn't left, under intensive sex offender registration. Intensive is the highest level of sex offender So you're saying that as a condition of continuing probation, the Connecticut court increased? That's my understanding, Your Honor. From, from reading that transcript, that's what you get? That's my understanding, yeah. You get that from that transcript, not from any place else? It's, it's, it's based on, he was represented at the time by competent and experienced counsel. He had a I'm parents and guardian. I'm asking you if that's the only source you have the only, for, is, for is, your conclusion is that it, there was an additional level of supervision imposed at that hearing. Is that the only it's basis? My, under, my basis is the understanding that intensive sex offender probation includes per se GPS, yes. Okay. And, and, and uh, uh, taking that out, let, let's, I mean, I, I've not read the transcript, so, uh, but let's assume we read the transcript and we say, we don't think the judge did that. And we say, we think Massachusetts still has the discretion with regard to GPS. Uh, but if the Connecticut judge thinks differently, the Connecticut judge should so order, and then Massachusetts will do what the Connecticut judge wishes. Does the compact survive that? Yeah, the compact would say that um, the, the petitioner has no private right of action to challenge under Rule 4.101 whether he's similarly situated or not. That's a right of the receiving state to determine how he should be supervised. So, so, so Massachusetts could, in its discretion, add GPS. So, so if Massachusetts added a whole host of things that, that, that was not mentioned in Connecticut, you're saying, I take it, that there's an, there's an, an internal administrative procedure and remedy, which is that the Connecticut court would then uh, say, no, this isn't what we intended. We will recall uh, permission to transfer probation to, to, to Massachusetts. And, 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 and I take it that if the, if the defendant is um, unhappy with that, he can appeal to the Connecticut Court of Appeals. That, that is correct, Your Honor. At any time under the compact, under Rule 5.101, this, this um, particular um, probationer remains a Connecticut probationer and can be retaken. He has no right to continue to live and reside in the state of Massachusetts. Just that evidence-based practices and best practices and data-driven decisions make it clear that it's better for offenders to live with their families and have a residence and have support and not be stranded in other states. So that's why Connecticut, in, in March of this year, allowed this, there were at least two decisions that were made by the Connecticut court to allow this probationer to return back to Massachusetts but the court said, defendant may return to Massachusetts, but do GPS there. That was the notation of the clerk at A91 of the record of the uh, respondent's addendum. Okay, I'm way you, over you. my time, Your Honor. I, I, I apologize. Understand, but we've, we've given you that time, so I thank you. I apologize, Your Honor. No, no, don't apologize. We gave you that time. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Joss, before you get warmed up. Yes, Your Honor. Is Mr. Go on GPS because either probation thinks the Connecticut judge in March of 15th so ordered, or because probation believes it is mandatory because he was convicted as an adult, or three, because the probation has exercised its own discretion and determined as a matter of discretion that it is appropriate for him to be on GPS? I think the answer is actually that it's more the first two, that Massachusetts is really only doing what it is that Connecticut ordered. The but but is it one or two? Because they're, they're a bit different. Well, initially, quite I believe, different, actually. certainly. So one, and I take it one was the original condition said probation, and two is no, the no. The one order. was said that the March fifteenth hearing. The oh, I'm sorry. Then I have GPS to there is now an order of the court that the court mandates that 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 that, that the court in Connecticut is mandating probation. Alternative two is that you think the, that the statute in Massachusetts mandates it because he was convicted as an adult. They're quite different. Let me start with one then. It certainly is one, and it would have been sort of fitting into one even before the violation, that Massachusetts is only doing, is interpreting and applying the Connecticut order. That Connecticut, in, his, in the initial conditions that Mr. Go transferred to Massachusetts with, there was a condition that said you will submit to electronic monitoring as directed by a probation officer. 
but, then. But didn't, uh, I, uh, yes, I, but just if it stayed in Connecticut, the probation officer could have said, no, I'm not doing it in this case, it, right? It's, that's entirely possible. He did not. He, he moved here precisely. He moved here. Right. But I mean, but, but in other words, that's not a command to do it. That, that's saying it's up to you, Mr. Probation Officer or Ms. Probation Officer, to figure out whether or not uh, he's going to have the GPS. I think that's right, Your Honor. But I think there's also, you know, what happens is that he comes here, there's a discussion with probation here. He then goes back to Connecticut and says, either modify or remove. And the court denies the removal, meaning that there is at that point no... Because it's in no, the discretion of the uh, Massachusetts the probation. Discretion of probation. Right. And with, at that point, that's where I think why I was saying that you sort of get into both the first and second of Chief Justice Gantz's points, is that when you come here, there is Section 47 in place, that there is an adult conviction. But then I think you also have, in March of 2015, an order that says, as part of the documents that come back to Massachusetts through the ICOT system, that was referenced by uh, counsel for the commission is something that says, do you know, go back to Massachusetts, do GPS there. And you Fundamentally, can do that as an order from Connecticut as it, opposed to just a practical resolution of the fact that the man didn't have, he wasn't wearing it at the time of the hearing and he didn't want to be picked up for another violation, which if you read the transcript seems to be the sense of it. Actually, Your Honor, I, I interpret it differently, and I think that that's, that's part of the problem, is that what Mr. <coughs> Goh is fundamentally claiming is that Massachusetts is misinterpreting the orders of Connecticut. If that's the case, then his remedy lies with Connecticut. If he believes that Massachusetts is misinterpreting or misapplying the orders of the sending state, he can certainly go to the sending state and ask that state to clarify, as he's shown himself capable of doing. He can go back and ask that court, and frankly, he could even ask for the evidentiary hearing that he now asks this court for, to be able to put in front of the Connecticut court all of the evidence that he says means that this is an inappropriate measure for him and that could it develop a full record in that court, You're which is the sending that, court. You're basically saying you think Connecticut requires GPS to be imposed in Massachusetts. At this point, I take this, the conditions, probation takes the conditions imposed by Connecticut to include GPS without discretion. And you base that on the transcript of that hearing? That uh, Massachusetts as, understanding as construed by uh, this gentleman's agency. As uh, the understanding is that intensive sex effects of vendor probation in Massachusetts, in, sorry, in Connecticut, is understood to include GPS. And if if Massachusetts is wrong about that, then Mr. Goh's remedy lies with Connecticut. It, it's fundamentally a question for the Connecticut court to interpret its own orders. That if Massachusetts is wrong, then that's a question but, for but, Connecticut. But let's to assume he order. goes. Let's assume he goes back to Connecticut and the judge says, oh, I didn't mean that. Uh, I think it's still in the discretion of the Massachusetts probation. Then does Massachusetts probation say we're going to exercise our discretion or does it say we think it's mandated by statute? I think at this point where Mr. Goh is now 18, that the, the, he would still have to be, that to the extent that Massachusetts had discretion to exercise, it would be that because he is an adult, there is a legislative determination that with an adult conviction comes GPS, that it would exercise its discretion to say, we understand it to be mandatory and therefore we apply it. Okay, and, and has Massachusetts or has probation yet exercised its own discretion apart from the statutory mandate? I think you see that in the letter that was sent from the commissioner to Mr. Goh's counsel prior to the filing of the single justice petition. And I would note that it's somewhat interesting that despite the fact that all of the single justice briefing was done before the violation in Connecticut, there was no mention of that fact. There was no attempt during the violation to say, you know, Your Honor, there is also this outstanding issue that there is, you know, Mr. Goh has briefed in Massachusetts um, and understand his understanding that as a applied to him, the GPS is unconstitutional. He simply could have raised those with the Connecticut court, in fact, can still do so. That there is nothing barring him, as, he, as shown by the motion to modify, as shown by the cases, the Connecticut cases cited interpreting what happens when you have a motion to modify that's denied or granted. If it's denied, there's a right to appeal on that. Mr. Goh has a variety of procedural options available to him in Connecticut to go and establish the record that he seeks here. What he said at the beginning was that he's fundamentally seeking an evidentiary hearing. He has that remedy available to him. It simply is not here. If there's a violation, if the Massachusetts probation department uh, determines that he has violated his probation, 
uh, is there a violation of probation hearing in Massachusetts, or does it take place in Connecticut? Only in Connecticut, Your Honor. So, and so that's is, rule 4. Are, are, are you saying that that uh, that the Massachusetts Department of Probation is essentially under the compact an agent of the state of Connecticut? And Massachusetts courts have absolutely no business getting involved. That's correct, Your Honor, and that's that's frankly throughout our brief. And the the explicit receiving state acting as the agent of the sending state is actually laid out in the I Chaos bench book and excerpted in the addendum attached to probation's brief. And in fact, that's the import of the rules. That if there is a violation of probation, whether it's of a sending state condition or a receiving state condition, the only jurisdiction over that is in the sending state. Even if that condition was absent from the sending state's original conditions, that any violation of a condition imposed in the receiving state, even if fully absent from the sending state, must be adjudicated in the sending state. And that's 4103. True, and uh, I was actually looking at the transcript of this revocation hearing, which is short and not terribly revealing. But let me go back to the question that you may have already answered, and that is when Massachusetts imposes additional conditions not imposed as part of the original sentence, mm -hmm. and the individual wants to essentially challenge the imposition of those additional conditions, that has to be done in the sending state, not in the receiving state, even though they have the conditions have nothing to do with the sending state? The mechanism for that, Your Honor, is particularly if the, if the offender came to Massachusetts, say, and in, said Massachusetts, su the offender believed that Massachusetts was supervising them in a way that was not consistent with the way Massachusetts supervised its own offenders. It would then, the offender would then make a complaint to the sending state. The sending state would then raise that with the commission, and the commission can take enforcement action. Hopefully would, there would be some sort of dispute resolution first, but then could take enforcement action against Massachusetts if Massachusetts were supervising the, the offender the, in a way inconsistent with the way it supervised its own offenders. Well, I'm not saying inconsistent, just additional. Well, I and, well, and I think that that's actually the, the, the sort of flip of that is there's a, I think, I, not quite sure how to pronounce it, but I think it's Krikevitz, um, which is a Delaware case where the offender there was actually a Delaware resident who had been convicted of OUI in New Jersey, which had transdermal alcohol monitoring as a mandatory requirement, and he wanted to be supervised in Delaware, and Delaware had no ability to implement that condition. And so what happened is he wanted to challenge the condition, and they said, well, you can't challenge that in the receiving state. You need to challenge that in the sending state. So that's an issue of the receiving state can't do it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's got to go back to the sending right. state. Right. But wouldn't the. This is different. I, I just, this is, it seems to me different. I think that when you look at the rules, the rules make very clear that the jurisdiction over the offender is retained at all points throughout I in the sending I state. I, I understand that hypothetically. All I'm saying is if he's here and Massachusetts imposes additional mm -hmm. conditions, not inconsistent, but in addition to, his remedy to challenge that is to go back to the sending state. It, I Even if the imposition of those additional conditions might raise a constitutional question because he's a juvenile. I think that's right, Your Honor, that ultimately the jurisdiction over that person resides in the sending state. And if the argument is that it's an unconstitutional condition, then that can still be raised but in would the, the sending would state. But would it get litigated in Connecticut? Yeah, they're going to interpret our Constitution? Well, I I'm, I'm think I'm looking more at a federal constitutional question, that that would be the same regardless. But that it, basically the option for the offender at that point would be to say, I'm being subjected to an unconstitutional condition, and then, then the receiving state can then change its conditions to either exclude that condition or to retake the offender. And because as five, uh, Rule 5.101 of the ICAS rule says, the, the ability to retake the offender remains with the sending state throughout, regardless of any cause, that they can be retaken at any time. So can we just, just look, sum that up for a second? You're saying that if his argument is that it's unconstitutional under Massachusetts, under the Massachusetts Constitution, his remedy is to somehow have um, Connecticut decide? Massachusetts thought, no, Your Honor, I don't think that would be right. You're essentially saying that, I think, that the compact is federal law and it preempts all forms of Massachusetts law. I think that including in, the Massachusetts Constitution. I think in signing on to the compact, what the legislature did was say, we are ceding some of our sovereignty 
to allow for the ability of probationers to transfer and parolees to transfer from state to state, and that to the extent that there are questions that arise that impact compact offenders, those need to be addressed through the mechanism of the rules. And there, there, there are still mechanisms under the rules to enable an offender to do that. Well, that might be nice for the state to do that, but what if you're the offender? Again, the offender has the option to raise but, with... But, but okay, so the offender goes back to Connecticut and says, under the Massachusetts Constitution, this is unconstitutional. Let, let's assume that the offender hasn't turned into an adult. Okay, so, so he's, he's age 17. And he goes back to Connecticut and says, they're imposing this on me as a mandatory thing. Uh, that's unconstitutional under Article 26. What is the Connecticut court supposed to do? Well, I think that in that circumstance that where he's saying that it's unconstitutional, that the remedy he has is to, he's, he was, if he's arguing that it's unconstitutional because it's cruel or unusual, that seems to me that it comes up in sort of two different ways, obviously the federal way or the state way. And he can address the federal way with the Connecticut court. Correct. The Connecticut court may, it may not even have to get to the state constitutional question because it does arise under both. Connecticut could say, we agree. It's cruel, it's unusual. We're gonna say, no, you may not be subject to GPS. At that point, then the person, the offender could ask to be re reassigned to Massachusetts, retransferred to Massachusetts. And Massachusetts could say that, you know, obviously we have this mandatory, this, if, if I'm sorry, if the person was a juvenile at that point under your hypothetical, that we now have the person who's a juvenile, that court has exercised its discretion and so we would not apply if that person was a juvenile. But I, and I think that fundamentally what Mr. Goh asks for is an evidentiary hearing. He has the ability to obtain that in Connecticut. And to the extent that he's arguing that Hansen should be extended to him, I think that even if it were, which there's no reason under the interpretive law of this court that it should at this point, certainly to the extent that he's arguing that discretion should be exercised, I would argue that the Connecticut court has done that on multiple occasions. So, so if he says, if the Connecticut court says, no GPS, period, no ifs, ands, or buts, he comes and will allow transfer to Massachusetts. Massachusetts has to accept him, and Massachusetts cannot impose GPS. Massachusetts would inform Connecticut at the time of the request to transfer that it cannot meet those conditions. Connecticut would then have the option to say, okay, then we're going to change our conditions, or they could say, then we're not going to send. Because while it's a mandatory acceptance in the receiving state, that does not make it a mandatory transfer in the sending state. And so Mr. Go would then have the option of either remaining in Connecticut or seeking to have his supervision transferred somewhere else. Okay, I'm, I'm still confused as to one point you made. You said you don't expect the Connecticut court to decide an issue under the Massachusetts Constitution. But if the claim is that it's a violation of the federal Constitution and the Massachusetts Constitution, and Massachusetts says, and Connecticut says, no, we don't think it's a violation of the U.S. Constitution, then what happens? Then I think Mr. Go has a, a different remedy in, he could certainly raise that with probation if if what happened is but the, but you you said you said that he has a remedy to challenge the constitutionality in Connecticut but not in Massachusetts the, certainly the federal constitutionality i think when we're talking about the state constitutionality if if Connecticut that, that's says that's the question where is his remedy to challenge the state con the, con the state constitutionality I think that as the commission has pointed out that the, you know, an action for declaratory or injunctive relief would be what it would most likely look like. But where, where is this? Is it state court, yeah, right? Yeah, where is that remedy? That it's certain, it's not, it's certainly not in, it, it certainly wouldn't start as an original jurisdiction action here. It wouldn't be a question of superintendents of inferior courts. That Mr. Go, because he has he has a number of other options to pursue before he gets to that point. That it seems like it's premature to even. Okay, but ask you're but you but you but you're dancing yeah. here. Uh, where does he go to challenge the constitutionality of a condition as cruel and unusual under Massachusetts law? Where does he go to challenge it? I yes, under Massachusetts as opposed to the federal constitution. I think that's a question that would start in the Massachusetts trial court. So we do have the ability, a Massachusetts court does have the ability to decide that issue. I think that because he is being supervised in Massachusetts that there is some ability to do that, but I think that before he gets to that point, because his 
the ability to actually modify those conditions resides with Connecticut, that we don't even need to get to that because he has a variety of other options yeah. before he even gets to So you'd say he'd have to exhaust other alternatives. Right. But if push came to shove, he still could make a declaratory judgment action here. Right. And as this court has repeatedly held, that if there are ways to avoid addressing the constitutional question, that that is what ought to be done. There are a variety of ways for Mr. Goh to avoid raising the constitutional question here by simply going back to Connecticut and asking it to clarify its order. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honors.